Hello, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, based on where you're located. My name is Christiana Linegar. Um, I'm located in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm the Director of Battery Science and Engineering here at Voltaic. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to our September webinar. Data-driven understanding of your batteries is key to long-term product success. Um, so we're joined by Tony Tai, who's one of our senior battery engineers at Voltaic, and he's going to be presenting the webinar today. Tony has spent the past 13 years deeply involved with battery manufacturing. Um, his experience includes building, operating, and ramping battery manufacturing plants that supply major OEMs in the area of EVs, aircraft, spacecraft, defense, as well as consumer electronics. Um, so Tony's bringing his Gigafactory experience to Voltaic as a senior battery engineer, where we're very excited to have him. Uh, he's also combining automation with data analytics to help solve the world's battery challenges, which is exactly what we need. <laughs> um, so Tony's going to walk you through why batteries matter, higher productivity techniques, risk mitigation techniques, and time-saving techniques. And then we're going to end the webinar with an interactive Q&A session. So before I uh, pass the mic off, just a couple of housekeeping notes on the webinar. So the audience is going to be muted during the entirety of the webinar, but we encourage everyone to submit your questions throughout the event, and we're going to address them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, in addition, we've provided some handouts, and you can see those in your GoToWebinar control panel. You can access our Build versus Buy Decision eBook the high cost of failure battery recalls infographic, let's make recalls a thing of the past, a solution brief, and our Google Nest case, case study. So last but not least, if you have any technical issues, please just reach out via the chat and we will attempt to get them resolved as quickly as possible. So let's kick things off. And with that, um, I'm excited to hear from Tony about how data-driven understanding of our batteries is the key to our long-term product success. Take it away, Tony. Thank you for that introduction, Christiana. So today, we're gonna talk about a few things. First, we'll go over why batteries matter and why they deserve special consideration. And then we'll go over some data techniques that can give you a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Uh, like Christiana said, these are divided into techniques to increase your productivity, techniques to mitigate risk, and techniques to save time. And if you haven't implemented these techniques already, we certainly hope you'll consider doing so by the end of this webinar. And one thing I wanna point out is, although we're doing all of these plots and graphs in Voltaic, uh, all of these techniques can be done by hand or in Excel or Python. Uh, so uh, Voltaic is just a, a very convenient and turnkey solution to do this type of automation, but by no means is it strictly necessary. All right. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is why do batteries matter? Uh, why do they deserve special consideration? Uh, aren't they just like any other part in your bill of materials, like say screws or gaskets? And the answer of course is no. So the reason batteries matter is because batteries are dangerous. Uh, they store energy and energy being released very quickly is a recipe to get on the news. So I like to consider the infamous case of the Samsung Note 7, where Samsung shipped phones and with batteries that weren't fully understood and weren't fully characterized. So these phones got into the hands of 2 million consumers. And then they started exploding. Now the brand is associated with battery fires. If you Google Samsung Note, it brings up these autocomplete suggestions of failure and battery concerns. So obviously they had to do a product recall. And aside from the obvious cost of replacing or refunding 2 million phones, uh, this damages their reputation, uh, their future prospects, and really the industry as a whole. Now, the really, really interesting thing from this case study is that Samsung's investigation found that the blame lay with their battery vendors' manufacturing processes. And despite that, this disaster is still remembered as the exploding Samsung Note 7 and not the exploding ATL cells. 
So the takeaway here is that if there's a problem with the product's battery, the customer calls you and not your battery vendor. And that's why it's important to fully understand and characterize the battery that goes into your application. And even if the batteries don't catch on fire and they don't explode, there's still many reasons to care about your battery. So what I have here, the plot on the right, shows that out of 48 nominally identical Panasonic batteries, a tier one vendor that knows what they're doing, there is still tremendous variation between how many cycles they will last. So the worst batteries reach end of life in 750 cycles, while the best batteries reach end of life in 1300 cycles. So these large variations in battery performance influence your defect rates and how much capital you have tied up in warranty reserves. And there's other costs associated with this, of course. So operators and technicians have to spend time troubleshooting and dealing with these defects, which lowers your overall productivity and throughput. And customers have to deal with product that has inconsistent lifetime. Uh, one example of this is uh, swelling phone batteries. I'm sure everyone's had experience with this one time or another. The battery starts swelling because of a gas buildup inside the battery, and this makes your device start bulging. It doesn't catch on fire, but the risk is always there in the back of your mind that this probably isn't right, and it's you know probably not the way this was designed. So the key message here is that even if the battery doesn't explode, battery issues still affect the bottom line of your organization. So I went over a couple ways that batteries can go wrong. Uh, now on the bright side, let's go over how they can go right. So because of the complexity of batteries, they're also an opportunity for your organization to develop a competitive advantage. So the most obvious example of this is battery lifetime. I mean, everyone wants a device that lasts longer than everyone else's. So the plot on the right here shows a typical EV battery lifetime. The blue line shows that the battery behaves with good lifetime under normal conditions. But the red line shows that if you fast charge this EV battery, it significantly degrades the battery's lifetime. Now, battery vendors, of course, will give you only the data about the blue line, and it's up to you to find out about the red line. So one really excellent case study of this is Nissan and Tesla back in the mid 2010s. So everyone knows Tesla developed significant competitive advantage by becoming essentially the first EV with a reliable and cost-effective battery, which captured them significant market share. So during this time period, one of their primary competitors was a Nissan Leaf, which unfortunately suffered from really poor press as a result of their battery issues. So Nissan Leafs, sold in the Southwest United States, where summer temperatures can exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit, experienced tremendous battery degradation in the first few years because of insufficient cooling systems. So the LEAF had an advertised range of 84 miles, but LEAFs were showing up in CarMax lots with ranges of only 10 miles. So why did this happen to Nissan, but not Tesla? And the answer is there's a lack of test data about the effect of temperature on the battery's lifetime. So this is an example that knowing more about your battery translates into significant advantages in the marketplace. Okay, so we hopefully convinced you that it's important to understand your battery, but what information do you need? So the majority of battery vendors will send you a, a battery lifetime plot and some simple specs, and that's all you really have to make a decision on. So here's a metaphor. You wouldn't rent an apartment based only on how many bedrooms it has. You need additional information such as where it's located, what features it has, and if it's a good fit for your life. Yet this analogy pretty much describes the relationship between most battery suppliers and their customers. A single plot of capacity versus cycles is insufficient information to know if a battery is right for your application. So if your application uses a lot of power, you need to know how this plot changes with increasing power demand. If your application uses 
a long shelf time, you need to know how this plot changes over time. Essentially, you need additional information to make an informed decision. But where do you start? Batteries are extremely complex electrochemical devices that have just tons of underlying reactions going on. It's hard to interpret, interpret this data and to know what to look for. The question always comes down to, how do you tell if a battery is good or not? And unfortunately, there's really no simple equation that can tell you that. Batteries are kind of like organisms in that no two batteries are exactly alike. And this is actually problematic for mass production because how can you tell when those small variations suddenly will matter? So to go back to the Samsung Note 7 case study, the battery fires were caused by a corner being pinched, which caused the internal separator to not insulate correctly. The question then becomes, how can we tell which batteries have pinched corners and which don't, especially if we're unable to look inside the battery? What we need to do is to capture the signature of what a battery with pinched corners looks like. And luckily, these physical issues like these pinched corners have an impact on battery metrics, such as capacity, resistance, and cycle life. This simplifies things so that it's not necessary for most people to deeply understand this electrochemistry. The solution is to use data to catch these kinds of problems. Okay, so we established why it's important to understand batteries and more specifically the battery metrics. Uh, the common ones are being displayed on this spider chart. So you got things like uh, energy density, specific energy, cycle life, temperature, et cetera. So the next challenge is that different applications care about different battery metrics. So a battery that's optimized to be great for one application would be terrible for another one. For example, power tools prioritize a battery's ability to charge and discharge quickly and also being lightweight. And this is the exact opposite of what a battery for solar panels requires. Uh, it wants a battery that has a long cycle life and inexpensive. It doesn't care about uh, how lightweight it is. Uh, similarly, uh, what you would want in a pacemaker is the exact opposite of what you'd want in a speedboat. So the takeaway here is that you need, you need to identify what key metrics are relevant to your application. And once you know what your requirements are, you know what target you're aiming at. So the next step after that is to analyze data to generate insight on how to turn this knowledge into competitive advantage. And this is what the bulk of the webinar is gonna be covering today. So next we're gonna overview some non-obvious uh, techniques on how to extract useful information from your battery data. And these techniques live inside enterprise battery intelligence. Uh, enterprise battery intelligence is useful for simplifying your workflows by automating away the really tedious analysis by hand. And it provides expertise to answer tough battery questions. Uh, probably, probably the most important thing is that it saves time and money by reducing defects and allowing you to launch faster. So if you're like, the vast majority of our customers are doing a thumb drive dance where data is stored in multiple locations, data analysis is slow, cumbersome, and manual. Uh, you're plotting things one by one, everything is done in Excel, and uh, it's a real nightmare. So this kind of approach is very reactive and it's uh, stage gated, which means you have to wait for someone to do the previous step before you can do your step, before we can move on to the next guy. Uh, not the ideal way of doing things. So the voltaic powered analysis, basically you have your data sources, you got your manufacturing line, you got your test labs, you got infield data sources, and it all goes to one place, one central place, and it lets you get your data faster, understand it sooner, and make good decisions to get you to market quicker. Think of it as automation plus analytics. Uh, it's essentially battery expertise in a box. So uh, before we jump into the data techniques, let's review why batteries are important. Uh, batteries are business essential, but there's an inherent business risk here. 
uh, understanding batteries well minimizes this risk as well as gives you a way to develop competitive advantage. And now we get into the fun part. So we have three categories of techniques that I'd like to show off today, each corresponding with a different business challenge. We're gonna look at techniques that increase your productivity, techniques that mitigate risk, and techniques that save you time. So first we're gonna look at techniques for increasing productivity. And if you do these things, it's gonna increase your production rate, it's going to decrease your defects. And if you're not doing it already, I highly, highly recommend that you look into implementing it after this webinar. So the first technique, of course, is to plot your statistics. So this gives you an immediate and objective baseline of where you're currently at. So in this plot, I grabbed the sample of 20 cells and I plotted their lifetime, uh, essentially their discharge capacity. I can then compute the mean lifetime and two standard deviations. Uh, if your application has upper and lower spec limits, you can also add these two and compute a statistical process control chart, uh, commonly known as an SPC chart. And you can also calculate a CPK, uh, known as a process capability. So once you have a statistical baseline, you can use it as a reference to compare other things against it. And this is really powerful. For example, you can compare cell to cell to quantify how much variation you can or should expect and compute incoming quality control parameters like uh, rejection rates. You can also compute batch to batch by comparing samples of cells to determine if a new batch that's coming in, is it still meeting your specifications you originally qualified? Uh, or if the vendor is making some sort of change hoping you wouldn't notice which is uh, unfortunately more commonplace than we would like. Uh, finally, you could compare system to system to understand what type of issues and lifetimes your end users will experience. So why is it important to do the cell to cell batch to batch comparisons? Because it lets your manufacturing be more proactive instead of reactive. So just because something is currently within spec limits doesn't mean it's not increasing or decreasing and about to be out of control shortly. This allows you to see the trend of where it's going and what it's about to do, instead of getting a red alarm one day and having to react to it. So here's a non-trivial example. I took another set of 20 cells, I plotted their internal resistance and the mean and two standard deviations. Now you'll notice in the middle here, about 350 cycles in, I can see that there's a large step increase in internal resistance in one of the cells, uh, highlighted in red. And you can see that this change in internal resistance is much higher than two standard deviations of the rest of the sample. So this gives you a compelling reason to investigate this cell. Without plotting the statistics, there's no objective way to determine of this cell is good or bad, and you're at the mercy of your test technician who has to squint at this graph and say, eh, does this feel right, does it feel wrong? So the key point of this technique is that it allows you to develop a baseline to objectively compare things to. The second technique to increase your productivity is something called differential capacity analysis. So you likely have significantly more battery data than you can realistically analyze. So what this method does is it condenses all of that battery data into something that's easy to visualize and digest. So differential capacity analysis is a battery fingerprinting technique. Once you identified the fingerprint or signature of what a bad battery looks like, you can look at a differential capacity plot and determine if any given battery matches your profile of a bad battery. So think of it as being able to pick out a troublemaker out of a police lineup. And it's not just limited to bad or defective cells. You can also track if a vendor changes in material or if they're suddenly sending you something different. If they use a different ingredient or use less of it or they do something that changes the battery, you have proof. You have the before and you have the after any production changes will be visible on this plot. 
Another major advantage here is that this can be done with a single cycle, and that's extremely powerful. Instead of having to do testing out to 500 or 1,000 cycles, as is traditional, uh, you can only you can do this analysis with just a single cycle. And even better, battery vendors often do a single charge and discharge cycle on cells as part of their manufacturing process on cells before they ship them to you. So this kind of analysis can be run on that single cycle sent to you by your battery supplier, eliminating the need to do testing on your end. So on this plot, you'll notice that one curve looks very different from the rest of them, and it's that blue curve right there. So it clearly warrants some level of additional investigation. I plotted the internal resistance of all the cells using this analysis in gray, and the one that doesn't look like the rest is highlighted in red. So clearly, this is a low resistance cell that could be problematic if used in an application. Now, we have a fingerprint of what a low resistance cell looks like for future analyses. And that's a great thing because in manufacturing, you always want to be proactive and not reactive. So remember, this differential capacity analysis took one cycle, it completes in one minute. But this bottom statistical plot took 700 cycles to compute, uh, which takes about half a year to complete. This analysis is powerful because instead of reacting to a factory problem six months from now, you know today that there's an issue and that you can do something about it. So the takeaway with this technique is that differential capacity analysis can help you build a library of uh, what this defect looks like, and it can help you identify them for pretty minimal resources. Okay, the last technique for improving your productivity is incredibly powerful for answering tough questions, and it's called metadata to performance, and it's an analysis that can determine the effect of changing a variable. In really simple terms, it answers the question of how does changing this affect that? So the strength of this technique is its versatility. There are some really common questions that our customers answer using this type of analysis. It ranges from very straightforward and technical questions, uh, such as how does temperature affect rate capability? Or how does using cells that have been sitting around for a year affect the system lifetime? Then there's questions about the unique product environment, such as how does my, the vibration in my factory affect the integrity of the cell. Then there's quality questions, things like, we have a pallet full of low capacity cells. Uh, what happens if we sprinkle a few of them in per pack? Finally, there's vendor selection questions. Uh, how does changing to this new vendor cell affect the cycle life promises that we made? And I'd like to encourage everyone to think about how often you ask engineers and technicians uh, these kinds of how does this affect that questions. This happens all the time in the industry right now because there's always these subtle changes going on in materials and suppliers uh, due to the current state of the supply chain. So everyone knows there's a lithium shortage. It's only getting worse in the future. Lithium mines are not coming up as fast as they need to meet market demand. So substitutions and manufacturing changes are going to be a rule and not an exception in the future. So this type of analysis might seem like almost a magic ball. Uh, so in this example, my question is, how does changing the cell chemistry affect the system's lifetime? So what I have here is a few different chemistries for aftermarket iPhone batteries plotted because that's what I had lying around. Uh, you can see four different chemistry types that I'm comparing, LFP, LTO, NCA, and NCM. So clearly from this box plot, you can see that some chemistries are more consistent or they have longer lifetimes than others. Uh, if I had to make a decision on which one I wanted to go with, uh, this kind of analysis makes it super straightforward, which is the best technical option, which is uh, the plot in yellow there, NCA. 
So the only prerequisite with this type of analysis is it requires uh, well-labeled and well-organized data. Obviously, it's not possible for me to do this analysis if I don't know which data belongs to which chemistry. Uh, that's why it's super important to enable this type of very powerful analysis by supporting it with well-cleaned and well-organized data, which we'll talk about later. So I gave a bunch of examples of how uh, many organizations use this type of analysis to answer tough battery questions. Uh, I strongly encourage everyone to think about what kind of design and manufacturing problems that are specific to your company that could be answered with this type of analysis. Uh, sometimes you'll be really surprised by where the data will take you. Uh, for instance, I once had this problem with inconsistent capacity in my cells uh, that I thought was a vendor's fault. Uh, but by doing this analysis, I was actually able to trace it back to how we physically arranged our cells on the tester. So these testers were expelling heat uh, through a vent on the bottom. So the floor was at a higher temperature than the top and the middle of the tester, which made the capacity readings unstable because capacity is a function of temperature. Uh, I never would have thought to connect these two variables normally. Uh, but with this type of analysis, you can try any combination of factors and see what results. And uh, that's really powerful because the alternative is you send your engineers on a wild goose chase and you know they're looking at how two really wildly unrelated variables are affecting each other. It can seem like a, it can seem like a snipe hunt. Okay, so the next set of techniques that we'll talk about are techniques to mitigate risk and minimize the chances of a recall or a other adverse uh, event. So to take this back to the Samsung Note 7 case study again, this is taken straight from their official materials. You can see on the website, they're proud of this. So Samsung's response to the incident was to publish this eight point plan for how they're going to improve and prevent this sort of catastrophe going forward. And at this point, these standard protocols have been solidified as industry accepted best practices. So yeah, this is actually a great thing to do. In particular, it's very critical to have end of line tests that include electrical testing, accelerated tests, and the Delta OCV tests. Uh, so, Three out of the eight points on here, I would say, are exceptionally critical. Uh, these three tests will catch the majority of defects that would otherwise reach your end user. So the key here is that the three end of line tests that I mentioned, charge and discharge tests, accelerated use tests, and delta OCV tests, all provide very useful information that can be used to populate control charts, like you see on the right, and critical to quality reports that like you see on the bottom. So charge and discharge tests is good because it provides several key metrics, such as capacity and rate performance. Accelerated use test provides you cycle life and temperature performance. And delta OCV tests uh, tell you about storage, shelf life, and generally speaking, self-discharge. So having these metrics for each system allows you to get a historical trend analysis that you can analyze, which is important for any continuous improvement program. Uh, otherwise, how would you know if something is getting better or if it's getting worse? Uh, you need that end of line data. So the takeaway here is definitely, definitely implement these end of line tests to catch most defects before they get to your customers. And also because they provide really important data that you need for historical trend analysis. Okay, the next technique is to mitigate risk by automating your defect det detection. And I, I love this part. So human Q&A, QA, QC, is a very manual process that is really prone to errors. Uh, AI and machine learning can identify defects and defect patterns automatically. So this is important when you consider the danger of batteries. If you're a human uh, quality employee, 
uh, is really good. Maybe he catches 99% of the defects. Uh, that would be great in any other industry. Uh, but with batteries, that 1% can, uh, can mess you up pretty bad. So this is a very simple example of machine learning based on outlier detection. So what you see here in these plots is the red line is the data as it came in. And the blue line is data that has been uh, identified as anomalous or outliers or defective. So what it's doing is it compares neighboring data points and it calculates if they're outliers or not. Uh, simply put, it determines if something is not like the rest. And the power of this is that by at this point, you've noticed that we generated just enormous amounts of data, probably way more data than most engineering teams are capable of combing over. So machine learning can do the analysis for you, pouring over hundreds of different conditions and statistics. So in this example, if a human looks at that top graph of discharge capacity, they wouldn't think anything is out of the ordinary because you can see that little blue blip there at about 500 cycles. That certainly looks like it's well within the natural variation of the data. But comparing it to another statistic, this bottom graph of average voltage shows that it's an anomaly. So at this cycle, the average voltage of that cell went way down. But if a human is looking at this, they would only look at the capacity plot and not the average voltage plot. And then consider how many different metrics there are that are important to batteries. Remember the spider chart? So you got capacity, energy, power, temperature, cycle life, storage life, shelf life. You got all these things, and those are just the basic ones. Uh, no human can reasonably do quality control on all of that data generated. So I wanna show you guys a practical real world application of machine learning. And this is in predicting battery hazards and fires before they happen. So this was developed by one of Voltaic's partners and it's part of our platform. And what it does is it reads in electrochemical data, things like voltage and current, and then it computes five different parameters. So based on these five signals, it can then determine what the level of risk is. So the benefit of an application like this is it can alert an end user to an imminent fire hours or even days before it happens. So this is something you would definitely want to know before climbing into your EV or putting your power tools in the garage for the night. And this is done with data that we're suggesting in the previous slides a really simple time series such as you know voltage and current. So the takeaway with machine learning is that there's just enormous amounts of data that's generated and analyzing it requires automation. Okay, the next technique I wanna go over is not as exciting, but probably more critical. And that is setting up a battery specific traceability system. So traceability systems are required to intelligently handle product recalls, warranty claims, and audits. And everyone knows uh, that battery problems are an in inevitability. Uh, a good traceability system inspires confidence in customers when they inevitably have a problem. So your typical traceability systems are usually in Excel, uh, but one thing to consider with this approach is, is it really robust enough to stand up to scrutiny in court, you know, five to six years from now. So when you have a product recall, there is an ideal scenario. Uh, typically what happens is they send an auditing team to your manufacturing plant. Uh, the auditors arrive, you hand the auditors all the records. Uh, you want to identify all the root causes, uh, what equipment was affected, what products were affected. Uh, when you can identify clearly that you know, it was this lot, this batch that has the problem. Uh, the size and the impact of this recall is limited. On the other hand, there is the nightmare scenario, which I have firsthand experience of. And let me assure you, you do never want to be in this position. Uh, so in the nightmare scenario, they send the auditors. They show up to your plant. 
uh, they ask these really probing questions, which of course you say, I don't know, because you don't have the data. Uh, you hand over these just reams of Excel data. It's not really parsable. Uh, it's impossible to trace anything. You don't know what product was the, was made on which machines, which came from which suppliers. Uh, so really the only ethical and moral thing to do is you recall everything that possibly could be affected and of course, the financial impact of this is enormous. So what is the bare minimum traceability system? Uh, generally speaking, it's going to consist of serial numbers, dates, and critical information. So in this example I have on here, let's say we have a battery pack, which is, you know, a battery pack is made up of many cells. Each cell is made up of a cathode, anode, and separator. So let's suppose that there is a problem at the separator supplier, and they send you notice that everything produced between a certain date range is unsafe to use. So the traceability system has to be robust enough that it's possible to identify which cells use this separator and which battery packs those cells went into. So this way, the hazardous packs are identified and the scope of the recall is minimized. Uh, you also need to make sure that your traceability system is flexible enough that the tree can be traversed both forwards and backwards. In other words, uh, you should be able to select a battery pack at random, see what cells went into it, and what those batch IDs of the cathode material went into it. So this type of traceability is incredibly important, uh, especially as we see uh, the industry taken off with uh, time to market being uh, probably not ideally so more important than quality. Okay, so let's go over the last set of techniques. And this is my favorite because it saves you time. And saving times means your project timelines are shorter and you can launch sooner because everyone knows time to market is critical. So as we've seen with the previous techniques, Powerful analyses require good organization and data labeling. And one way to achieve this is through automation. For example, in our metadata to performance analysis, uh, we compare how different chemistries affect a system's lifetime. But suppose at the start of your product development program, uh, let's say you were already locked into a specific chemistry type and you didn't consider different chemistries. That means that the battery data that you have wouldn't have any information about what type of chemistry it is. So someone has to do the equivalent of you know, supermarket inventory. Uh, you go in with a price gun and you label and relabel thousands of files. So the solution here is to automate this record keeping process. And automation allows you to track and store tons of metadata that may not be immediately useful today, but it might be useful down the road. For instance, the data manufacturer is probably not important today, but it might be in a decade when there is some sort of warranty issue. And the trick is anticipating what kind of information might be useful in the future. You know, there's manufacturing information, so things like batch numbers, serials, dates of manufacturer. There's traceability information, so what went where, what vendor, the material types, and there's also something that's really important, the process information. So for example, the equipment used, the weld energy used to weld it, uh, the operator that did the operation. The takeaway here is that it's important to invest in the record keeping now uh, to prevent from having to pay that debt with interest down the road. And one benefit that isn't often mentioned with record keeping is that it's a prerequisite for in, in enabling other powerful analyses, such as uh, metadata to performance, or how does this affect that analysis? Okay, so the next technique for saving time is to automate your most frequently used analyses. So a top five global automaker did a before and after voltaic analysis, and they found that our automated analyses were anywhere from 20 times to 20,000 times faster. So we save the average engineer 10 hours per week or three months per year. And it's really important to note that the core competency of most engineering teams 
is usually not battery specific. Uh, it'll take them much longer to do a battery related task compared to a battery expert. And this is exactly why automation is so powerful because by solidifying the know-how of a battery expert into a single button click, uh, you can capture that expertise and use and reuse it. So it's kept at your organization forever and there's no risk of losing that expertise. Now, the most frequently used analyses, of course, depends on your specific industry. Uh, so take the time to see where the automation efficiency gains for you are. So one example I wanna go over is the auto industry. So what I have shown here is something called an HPPC protocol, which stands for Hybrid Pulse Power Characterization, uh, which basically simulates the demand that a hybrid vehicle places on a battery. So this is a very common industry standard test to determine how much power a battery can deliver at various states of charge, as well as you know, interesting things like its internal resistance. So this is a incredibly powerful, but incredibly tedious analysis, uh, which our automaker partners measured to take two and a half hours to manually analyze per test. And if anyone on the webinar has done this by hand, uh, my condolences to you because this is awful. So you can see the problem here if they need to analyze 50 cells a week, uh, as well as qualifying new vendors and checking up on old ones. They can take their engineering department in an entire week to, what can, to do what can be basically done by in a minute of automation. So the key to automating these type of analyses is something called component mapping. So HPPC is a series of charge and discharge pulses by automatically mapping where each charge, rest, or discharge pulse occurs at, uh, the program can then detect the rest of the hundreds of pulses and apply the map to it. So the takeaway with automating these analyses is that it doesn't just help you do it faster, which don't get me wrong, that's a, that's a great benefit, but it also retains the expertise in your organization. So, uh, you know, this HPPC protocol is an industry standard test. It's not changing anytime soon. Uh, it makes sense to get that knowledge solidified. Okay, the last technique for saving times is benchmarking your cells. So any product development program is gonna be looking at many vendors, many different chemistry types, and many different samples. So rather than just leaving it as a checkbox on a Gantt chart, you're gonna get tremendous value extracted by keeping a library of all the cells you qualify. So some of the key benefits is being able to select the best cells for your application, as well as the second and third sources. Having that data on hand already allows you supply chain agility because instead of having to wait to requalify and retest cells, uh, you have all the information already. So as we've seen over the past two years, uh, supply chain uncertainty can cause lead times to go from four weeks to 40 weeks. And it has been a crazy ride. Keeping a benchmark of all the cells that you tested keeps options open and it accelerates qualification and development. So one example of a benchmark is a battery industry partnership between Voltaic, Batimo, and Energy Assurance. So this index has all of the commonly available cells tested to industry standard protocols. It has tests and performance data and common metrics that most customers are interested in, such as capacity, life, energy density, and so on. Uh, you can plot different cell vendors on a Vagoni plot and see who has the best combination of energy and power. There's also teardown reports, battery models, composition reports, so you can inspect what's inside and how it's constructed. So the takeaway message here is there are so many batteries out there. Keep the data you generate during test and qualification programs and use them as reference to inform future vendor and product selections because you never know when you need a second or third source. Okay. 
So those were all the techniques I wanted to cover. Let's go over the conclusion. Uh, so in this talk, we went over why batteries matter. And they're important because they are often mission and business critical for any electrified product. And because of how complex batteries are, it's also an opportunity to develop competitive advantage in the marketplace. Uh, these advantages are increased productivity, risk mitigation, and saving time. So in the increasing productivity column, uh, you do that by plotting your statistics. So you know where your baseline is. You get fingerprints with differential capacity analysis. And you see how changing this affects that with metadata to performance. In the mitigating risk column, uh, you do that by performing and capturing data from industry standard end of line tests. Uh, automating defect detection with machine learning, so you're not reliant on human Q&A. And you also want to uh, develop a battery-specific traceability program. In the saving time column, you want to automate your record keeping and data labeling, automate your most frequent and used analyses, and of course, benchmark your data uh, so you don't have to do the same tests on the same vendors over and over. Uh, so that concludes uh, my talk. I hope this has been useful. And if you aren't doing any of these already, I really hope that you'll look into implementing these techniques because it gives you a significant advantage over anyone that isn't. And now for the Q&A portion. Christiana, you want to take over? Yes, excellent. Thank you, Tony. And thank you to the audience for providing some questions. Um, I just wanted to encourage anyone that has questions, you can put them in the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And we're gonna take the last five to 10 minutes of the webinar to answer those. So I'm gonna start with a question um, that someone put in the box and it is a, a very great question for the industry. The question is, how can I speed up the battery's life cycle testing? <laughs> and so this is a, a pressing question, I think, um, you know, that's relevant to any type of, of industry for testing. Cycle life testing takes a long time. So I'm going to give the question a stab, and then Tony, I'd love to hear if you have any additional thoughts. Um, you know, life cycle testing can take months or even years. And from Voltaic's perspective, instead of thinking about ways you can speed up the actual testing, I would reframe the problem to say, how can you actually fail faster in lifecycle testing? And failing quickly is actually a common paradigm in the software industry. Uh, here at Voltaic, we straddle the software industry as well as the battery industry. So failing quickly is a uh, paradigm in agile software development. Um, so how can we fail quickly in cycle life testing, or how can we identify failures quickly? And Tony uh, gave us a technique. Um, it was an advanced anomaly detection technique. It was actually called the local outlier factor method. And this is one such way you can identify failures or anomalies in your cycle life testing quicker uh, than maybe you reach your, um, your exit criteria which could be a capacity criteria. Uh, other such ways to fail quicker or understand the outcome faster than waiting till the end of the test are um, is another uh, method, just machine learning in general. Um, so data tools that can support you in accelerating the understanding of what's happening in your life cycle testing is the way I would, I would uh, answer this question as opposed to techniques or protocols in actually accelerating the testing itself. Um, Tony, do you have anything to add there? Uh, essentially, how can we speed up the battery's life cycle testing? Yeah, so in addition to what you mentioned, Christiana, uh, I hate to put on my senior engineer hat, and I'm sure one that has senior engineers at their organization is so sick and tired of hearing this, but I'm going to say it depends. And the reason I say that is because you might want to re-examine uh, what kind of questions are you trying to answer with a cycle life test, which everyone knows takes forever, takes half a year, a year, more. Uh, could those same questions be answered by different techniques that 
don't take half a year and instead take a minute or 10 minutes or a day or whatever. Uh, so it depends on what kind of question you're trying to answer. Uh, for example, if, uh, if you could use differential capacity analysis to determine if there is some sort of difference or change in the cell uh, in terms of what you're getting from your vendor, uh, you could do plotting statistics to see if a linear uh, regression line is a good uh, estimator of future performance or is your data very non-linear. Uh, you could use metadata to performance to answer any questions about, uh, you know, is there did you have some sort of change and you're trying to re-qualify? Uh, maybe that could be a shorter route. Great techniques. I think we have a, a good balance there, Tony, of um, yeah, techniques to apply in the data analysis between both, both of our answers. So we have another question. This is a, an interesting one, um, but I think it's very relevant. How do you ensure that the data that is used or that you get is authentic and not manipulated or corrupted? And I'll start again with the voltaic answer. Um, one of the parts of our platform is we have an entire data integrity and data analysis pipeline to ensure the data is not corrupted as it comes in. We also harmonize data, so independent of the origin of the data, all of the conventions and definitions with the, in the data are uniform. Now, Tony, can you give us some insight on techniques we could use to ensure that the data is not manipulated or that it's authentic? Yeah, that's an exciting question. Best question I had in months. Okay, so <laughs> uh, if someone is manipulating your data, they're typically calculating some sort of regression equation and putting some sort of noise signal on top of it. Uh, so the easy checks are to see if it fits some regression equation like you know y equals mx plus b. Uh, the other thing you can do is plot the statistics. Uh, likely the standard deviation is going to be some constant number or the slope will be some constant number. Uh, so there's there's definitely mathematical techniques you can use to see if someone is manipulating your data. Uh, and then there's always, of course, the machine learning route where, you know, if you get a R squared of 1.00, then obviously something's up. Or if you get, you know, some sort of uh, R squared value of, you know, 0.999999. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can use to to see if someone is sending you uh, bad or manipulated data. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, that's a, a tricky one, um, but an important question. Okay, so another great question. How much of what you presented today uh, is chemistry or cell specific, or can it be applied across different chemistries, across different cells, across different form factors? Yeah, so good question. Uh, everything that I presented today is uh, chemistry agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you're doing LFP, LTO, NCA, whatever. Uh, so there's, there, of course, there is differences between chemistries, but in terms of battery metrics, uh, typically what you see is, you know, energy and power densities are different. Uh, the slopes of the line is different. The voltage response is a little different, uh, but the key principles are the same. And uh, you know. All of these techniques can be done on any chemistry. Yeah, it's one of the beauties of the platform. It's agnostic and applicable across the whole across the whole development life cycle. Um, we have another question: Will or has Voltaic made cell and battery data open source from research? Uh, how can we share data across the community? Um, of researchers and people in industry. So this is a, a really um, a really relevant question. Uh, we actually just released a new product called Voltaic Community Edition, and this is an open access software environment with data that's been aggregated um, from industry and academia, where of course the data is free to share openly. In addition, in Voltaic Community Edition, uh, we have open access scripts 
that leverage uh, some of the frontier techniques in academia as well as in industry for some of the techniques we talked about today. So we just had a press release on Voltaic Community Edition about two weeks ago, and there's information about Voltaic Community Edition on our website. At the top of the website, there's a tab called Community, and it talks all about Community Edition. But the idea is to provide to industry, as well as academia, open access to scripts and data to share uh, the learnings across, across industry. Um, let's see. Um, I have another question about EV rapid charging and if we have any pointers about how to accelerate or optimize EV rapid charging. And to be honest, this sounds like a, a webinar for the future because I think this is an entire, <laughs> uh, an entire hour worth of content. Um, Tony, do you have any initial tips or pointers about EV rapid charging? Uh, sure, there's a couple of protocols that are very uh, relevant to uh, EV rapid charging. So the HPPC technique that we went over, of course, is the industry standard. Uh, now, I understand that the HPPC test is a series of charge and discharge pulses, which doesn't exactly match what uh, fast charging is. But the important thing that you get out of HPPC protocols is you get a resistance at various states of charge and then you can optimize your protocol around that internal resistance because what do batteries hate they hate heat and resistance is where you're getting that internal heating is from so uh, definitely look at hppc protocol and i believe there are some other automaker specific protocols uh, that i don't remember off the top of my head uh, christiana do you do you remember the other ones no, um, not off the top of my head, but I think this is really honestly a seed for a future webinar, which is exciting. <laughs> exciting to have one on, on rapid charging. Um, another question just came in, and Tony, you touched on this, and I think you have a lot of experience in this industry. How can you be confident that your test results would stand up in a recall or in court? You know, what are some of the steps or, or tips um, that can be taken? Uh, I'm not too sure what the, the question is asking. So I think it's getting into device traceability and what types of records or what can you do internally to ensure that you're protected to the best that you can be um, in, in the case of a recall. Ah, okay, that makes more sense. So with product recalls, uh, the key things to have in your traceability system are, of course, the dates, the serials, and the uh, critical information. So essentially what happens when you get dragged to court, and I hate that I have firsthand experience of this, is you ha basically have to prove that you have uh, records that show this was produced here, this is where it went, this is where what materials were used, these were the batch numbers, uh, if the question is asking, like, uh, you know, <laughs> do I need to get my, my records notarized? Uh, no. Uh, just having a good system in place shows that uh, there was a good faith effort in uh, ensuring that the correct systems were in place and that they're working and that they're functional. Uh, you don't need, a, like, a sign-off or anything. Uh, pending, of course, what your quality manufacturing system says, uh, if your quality manager says you do, and uh, stand corrected. All right. So with that, we're at the hour. Um, we have a couple questions related uh, to, you know, our sales process and the cost of our software. Um, you can direct those questions to info at voltaic.com um, for anyone that's that's interested in sort of those more detailed, less technical questions that Tony and I can't, can't answer at this time. But we really appreciate your attendance. Um, we really appreciate uh, the engagement with the content. We hope it's been useful. Um, there'll be a uh, download available of this webinar recording for a couple of you that asked. And in addition, I want to remind you that we have four handouts in the GoToWebinar control panel. 
And finally, I'd like to just thank Tony for his experience and for putting together uh, these great this great content for us all. So um, be on the lookout for our next webinar series uh, next month, and we are always interested in, in topics you'd like to hear about. So please feel free to send us an email at info at voltaic.com if you have a topic you're just dying, dying to learn. All right, um, I hope everyone has a great week and, and thank you so much for your attendance.